final. Torval and Dean are on Good Morning Britain tomorrow from 6. With a new album on the way, Michael Bublé joins Lorraine at 9. Bridget and star Jonathan Bailey is live on This Morning at 10. And soap star couple Amy Walsh and Toby Alexander-Smith catch up with The Loose Woman at 12.30. Now with the latest news in Northern Ireland, it's UTV Live with Paul Clark and Rose Neal. Hello and welcome, you're watching UTV Live at 6. Good evening, these are the headlines. The Secretary of State says the government will move on abortion services after May's assembly election. MLAs sit at Stormont for the final time in this mandate before hitting the campaign trail. The boss of P&O admits the company broke the law by not consulting unions before sacking 800 staff. We were required to consult with the unions. We chose not to do that because we believe... We chose to break the law. And emergency services are checking that no one has been trapped after a building collapsed in North Belfast. Also tonight, Waterford enjoys a royal appointment with Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall. And tomorrow looks like another pleasant day with plenty of sunny spells. I'll have the food forecast later in the programme. The Secretary of State has signalled that the government will move towards ensuring abortion services are available in Northern Ireland. Brandon Lewis said that the government will act after May's Assembly election if progress isn't made and the move has divided opinion. Here's our health reporter, Deborah McAleese. It is one of Northern Ireland's most socially divisive issues and one that Stormont's politicians have repeatedly failed to resolve. A deadline set by Westminster last year to progress abortion legislation here runs out next week. So the Secretary of State has signalled that the government will act on the issue straight after the May Assembly election if no progress is made. Not surprisingly, reaction to this is divided. Well, it's a relief, first of all, um, as a person who was forced to travel in order to access my own abortion health care. I know what the degradation of forced travel actually means. Every single day for the last 25 years, I have been personally involved in this battle for the protection of unborn children, and that's something that I and others will continue to do. It has been two years since a framework for abortion services was established here. In a statement today, the Secretary of State said the executive's failure to progress services was unacceptable. Brandon Lewis said that without access to services in Northern Ireland, women and girls are being placed at an increased risk of harm. He added that he was committed to making regulations and directions straight after the election to place a duty on the Department of Health to make abortion services available as soon as is reasonably practical. He warned that if the Department of Health doesn't comply, he is prepared to use his powers to intervene. But any moves on abortion services are likely to face further challenges. We may have lost the battle, but we haven't lost the war because this battle will continue. So the battleground will be the next election. An Alliance for Choice won't be going anywhere. We'll be continuing to support women and pregnant people. We'll be continuing to lobby. Um, we expect challenge to this, but it is absolutely challenge that we are ready for. Despite Mr Lewis's warnings today, it could still be some time before this issue is resolved. Well, moving on to coronavirus now, and the Health Minister has announced that free PCR tests will end for most people next month. And lateral flow tests will only be free for those with COVID-19 symptoms. Well, Deborah joins us now. Deborah, mass testing coming to an end. Why? Well, Rose Robin Swan said that this reflects the new reality of where we are in the pandemic. It's two years on. Coronavirus is still here, but the risk posed from coronavirus isn't as dangerous as it once was. And a lot of that is down to mass vaccination and the fact that Omicron isn't as serious as previous variants were. 
and it mirrors as well the direction that England is going. Now, the Department of Health has said that this move isn't down to funding, uh, but if you think about it, it will start to cut the cost, cut the cost of the pandemic. So who exactly will be entitled to a test? OK, well, the free PCR tests will only be available to a very small group of individuals, those at risk and those that it's recommended by health professionals. So free lateral flows will cease for the majority of the population, except those who have symptoms and those who are going into settings like care homes and hospitals. But this can be reviewed at any stage should another variant ar arrive that is more serious. Now, earlier, I spoke to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and she said that despite this move, we still do need to be extremely careful. People need to continue to be very vigilant, to make safer choices, to take care, particularly if they are visiting, attending for care or find themselves in a healthcare environment. It's very, very important. Wear face coverings, make sure people attend to get vaccinated or boosted when they're called um, and then use testing judiciously should you develop symptoms. And of course, all of our public health um, professionals will be advising on any other use of testing that is required. And of course, you know, we do have to be responsible because, you know, just look at the pressures that our hospitals are still under. Tonight, there are 538 coronavirus inpatients. And that, of course, is putting so much strain on the system. Deborah McAleese, thank you very much. The Stormont Assembly has had its last sitting for this mandate. MLAs have cleared their desks, with many preparing to hit the campaign trail ahead of May's election. It's been a day of finalising legislation and reflecting on the last five years and looking at what lies ahead for the Assembly and the Executive. Our political correspondent Vicky Hawthorne reports. It's the end of a Stormont mandate like no other. There was singing and dancing to celebrate the passing of an SDLP bill that will make period products free in schools and health settings. Mr Deputy Speaker, we live in a great place and as we've seen when we work here, we can deliver. This is a positive, positive message. Generosity across the chamber, of course, hasn't always been there. Political disagreement meant the Assembly didn't sit for the first three years of this mandate. The last two have been dominated by COVID and the recent collapse of the executive. An MLA who has chosen not to return after the May the 5th election has a warning for those who do come back. It's positive today. We've had the period products bill passing. I'm hoping to pass the fair employment for school teachers bill as well. But this, this assembly and this executive has uh, hard work ahead uh, to really represent the people of Northern Ireland property. Some key issues that we need to work on. We need uh, a good assembly election and a, an executive back in place afterwards. A new permanent display of political portraits on the walls of the Great Hall at Stormont are a reminder of the challenges in the past. Today's parties are preparing for the future, but the old problems are never far away. The executive collapsed five years ago because of the DUP and it's collapsed in recent weeks because of the DUP. In the first instance because of the RHI scandal, which was, you know, the over £500 million, almost £500 million being taken out of the public purse. A scandal that was delivered by the DUP, a scheme that was delivered by the DUP. And then again, only a number of weeks ago, whenever the rest of us were trying to rally around and deal with the cost of living crisis, the DUP walked away. So there's a common factor there in terms of the collapse of these institutions. We have a positive agenda to go forward on. Uh, unfortunately, this contrasts with the very divisive approach that Sinn Féin are taking in their divisive border poll proposals, which will plunge Northern Ireland into uh, months, if not years, of both uncertainty and divisiveness. So we think there's a real choice for people in Northern Ireland. This is possibly the most important election that I've ever fought. The Ulster Unionists believe with the right attitude, Stormont can work. This last two years, what has been proven is there good government here is possible, that business can be done and I think people will recollect um, the, the work of the Health Minister in particular, Robin Swan, and the things that he has driven through, particularly the Children and Adoption Bill, which is something close to my own heart, the Organ Donation Bill, and some of these things that have lain about for years um, that have now come to fruition. By the close of business this evening, it's expected that the Assembly will have passed six bills of legislation today on matters from free hospital parking to the creation of safe zones around abortion services. It's been a race to get all outstanding business completed. An election marathon now lies ahead. But who will be celebrating? And will the results bring the full return of the Assembly and Executive? 
Vicky Hawthorne, UTV Live, Stormont. Well, let's uh, cross now to Stormont and speak to our political editor. Tracy, how busy was this last day of term? Very busy, Paul. Six bills, no mean feat. Shows you what our politicians can do when they really put their shoulder to the wheel. And I have to say, in this mandate, only two years, don't forget, they got 56 bills across um, past in those two years. Now compare that to the last five-year mandate when they got 78. So it does show when they work together, they can achieve things. What would be the marks out of 10 then for this mandate? Well, I think there will be ups and downs, no doubt about it. It was a mandate that was more down than up, let's face it. Those three years when it was down, then the new decade, new approach deal meant that it got back up for the two years. We had that wobble last year when it looked like Sinn Féin wasn't going to nominate a Deputy First Minister following Edwin Poot's uh, leadership over the Irish language. And there have been very toxic relations between the big two, and we saw that again in Vicky's report. Arguments over RHI, Brexit, protocol Irish language but I do say that there has been some positivity particularly at the start of the pandemic when most particularly Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill then first and deputy first ministers worked hard together and there were genuine positive relations between the two women to try to react to what was a very frightening circumstance of course all of that went to the wall after the Bobby Story funeral and now relations are not good. This mandate has literally stumbled over the line with an executive not working properly because the DUP have resigned their first minister. And no guarantees, Paul, after this election that this assembly will be back. In a few seconds, Tracy, and I mean that, in just a few seconds, the Northern Ireland Secretary has signalled he's going to take action on abortion services here, but not yet. Yes, and some people are happy about that, others not. But I think there is concern that this is a Secretary of State reaching in to devolve powers, to, to take power. And that will have concern if the Assembly is down locked long term. Tracy, thank you. A building has collapsed on one of North Belfast's busiest roads. Emergency services are at the scene on the Antrim Road, checking that no one has been trapped inside. Well, we can join Judith Hill now. Judith, what is the latest there? Well, you can see behind me right inside the remains of this building that dramatically collapsed here at lunchtime. I'm standing right on the junctions of the Antrim Road and the Limestone Road. It's a busy spot and it was a busy time of day when the gable wall of this Chinese takeaway crashed to the ground. Now, emergency services are still working hard here. It's been a massive operation here this afternoon. The air ambulance was here, specialist fire rescue crews, paramedics all on standby, all on high alert, all fueled by fears that there may have been someone inside this building. Sniffer dogs were sent in to comb the area. Thankfully, they so far haven't detected anything. Now, it's been a shocking afternoon for everyone here in North Belfast. We're going to hear from a number of people who were here. First up, we have a bar owner who witnessed the immediate aftermath of the collapse. Then you'll hear the voice of a local resident who actually lives directly behind the Chinese takeaway. I jumped up and looked out the window and I could just see the rubble, smoke coming from the rubble and the rubble just going across the road and uh, knew Adam and then people started to ring me and said they'd realised the building had collapsed and I said well I'd just seen the end of it. If there hadn't been anybody passing it at the time, it would, would have been fatal. Definitely. They had thought that the building would fall down but they reckon that the rest of the building is very unstable and that um, it'll, be, it'll probably all come down. It was a working business last night, by the grace of God, that nobody's dead here. Well, a huge cordon remains in place tonight. And actually, just before we came on air, police moved us back from the scene as search and rescue crews work behind me over my shoulder. You can see them working to try and secure this area and keep it as safe as possible. They, along with police, paramedics and fire crews and ambulance all remain at the scene here. Sniffer dogs, as we speak, are still searching inside this building. So tonight here in North Belfast, it's fair to say that everyone remains on high alert. Judith Hill, thank you very much. Five people have been charged with trying to cover up the death of a 27-year-old woman who was killed in a car crash in Dundonald last June. 
Charlotte McHugh was later found dead at a house in Ballybean. Eden Wilson followed today's proceedings at Newtonard's Magistrates Court. In the early hours of June the 1st last year, a black BMW crashed on the Cumber Road. By the time officers arrived, those inside were reported to have left the scene in a different car. A short time later, a 27-year-old woman's body was found at a house in Ballybean. Stephen Cunningham, who's 26 and from Belfast Road in Bangor, is charged with 12 offences, including causing the death of Charlotte McHugh. He's also charged with driving while unfit through drink or drugs and perverting the course of justice by removing an injured person from the crash and discarding of their clothing. Two men and two women are also charged with perverting justice and assisting an offender. Adrian Aiken, who's 32 and from University Avenue in Belfast, was accused of attempting to conceal a vehicle. While the court heard his partner, 45-year-old Emma Morgan, from the same address, attempted to provide an alibi. 32-year-old Thomas Reynolds from the Falls Road is alleged to have helped Cunningham dispose of a jacket and of moving Charlotte McHugh from the crash. The court also heard 31-year-old Tanya Galway, whose address cannot be given, allegedly failed to immediately secure medical assistance for the victim. A detective constable told the court she believed she could connect each of the accused to the offences. The case was adjourned until the 19th of May. Eden Wilson, UTV Live. A man has died after being assaulted in North Belfast last Friday. 31-year-old Joseph Rich died yesterday after being wounded in the neck on Flack Street. A 30-year-old arrested on suspicion of attempted murder was later released pending further inquiries. The chief executive of P&O has admitted to MPs at Westminster that the company broke the law by not consulting with unions before sacking nearly 800 staff. Ferries have been cancelled since last Thursday after the shock announcement. Jordan Motes reports. This time last week, P&O bosses broke the news to workers they were being let go. This morning, the same bosses were being questioned by MPs at Westminster. The company's chief executive opened by acknowledging the distress caused. Can I start, please, with an apology? Um, actually, an apology to um, the seafarers that were affected on Thursday last week, an apology to their families, and an apology to the 2,200 of our employees who have had to face very difficult questions over the last week or so. Um, and you may see this as a late apology, and I just want to reassure you the reason that um, you're hearing this, I guess, for the first time today is because I've spent the last week in the business talking to our people one-to-one. -one. The announcement came out of the blue on St Patrick's Day. Workers were told their jobs were going immediately. MPs today questioned the legality of that. There was no consultation with unions or workers and no notice given to the government about the redundancies. The company attempted to explain why. There's absolutely no doubt that we were required to consult with the unions. We chose not to do that because we believe... You chose to break the law? Because we chose not to consult and we, will com and we are and will compensate everybody in full for that. I recognise that this is a really When difficult... you get in your car and drive down the motorway and you see the 70 mile an hour sign, do you say that that's not going to apply to me, I'm going to do 90 uh, because I think it's important that I do that? Is that how you go about your life? No. No, it isn't. Unions at the committee were less than impressed with what's gone on. Nobody's discussing, as far as I can see, how we're going to get these people back to work. Because this company has made flagrant breaches of the law, as just been described. They've done it deliberately and they've factored in what they're going to have to pay for it. A week on and there is still no indication of when the Larn route will be restarted. Jordan Moats, UTV Live. So to come on the programme, 50 years on, we reflect on Belfast's Ring of Steel. And it's a royal affair as the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall enjoy the delights of Waterford. So do stay with us, we'll be back in just a moment.
hella fresh. From family favorites to veggie meals, get delicious recipes and fresh ingredients that make you feel great. Order your box now at hellofresh.co.uk. For that warm feeling that comes with reliable and efficient heating, ask your local heating engineer about warm flow at the heart of a cozy home. There, they're on next week. What have you got in mind? Northern Ireland, a small step to a giant adventure. Book your next giant adventure at discovernorthernireland.com. Hello once again, you're watching UTV Live with Rose and Paul. Now, it's 50 years since the centre of Belfast was encircled by a so-called Ring of Steel, designed to keep the bombers out of the city centre. It was dismantled in the advent of peace. But today, to mark its 50th anniversary, the security cordon was recreated by performance artists who recorded people's memories of that unique time in Northern Ireland's history. Barbara McCann reports. It was part of normal life here for more than 15 years. 12 foot high barriers and barbed wire encircled the city centre, designed to fortify it against the bombs. Having handbags or prams searched was an everyday occurrence. The security cordon is long gone, consigned to the history of the troubles. I would have come into Belfast with my mum and my sister every Saturday and uh, I clearly remember going through the the checks and uh, mum having her bag searched and going down there some collies and rubs and cleavers. Never really thought anything of it. I remember we used to come down in the 70s there with my father and we used to have to go through and we'd get searched by the soldiers and our bags searched and all and done it every day in here so it's just a regular thing. Today performance artists took to the streets to redraw the lines of the security perimeters four main gates. They were part of a new project designed to capture the public's memories of going through the checkpoints and to facilitate storytelling across communities and generations. So that high security thing was a, a shared moment, but it was also speaking to everyday life rather than this, this sort of traumatic events. And so it might, the storytelling in this uh, project might reveal some of the sense of humour, some of the mundane drudgery of living your life against the backdrop of the troubles. Movement in and out of the city centre was restricted. The security cordon controlled by armed soldiers, the public searched by specialist security staff. I'm surprised to hear about the, uh, the, big, the big gates and the steel shutters and how the, the, it's called the ring of steel. And you're just thinking, oh my goodness, things must have been so bad. So it's not about bringing people back to that period of time. It's allowing them to uh, consider what they do or don't remember. Or also, you know, for younger generations, like what have they heard from the older generation? Because I think when we look back to periods like this, what's interesting is it encourages us to think about how far we've come. Memories gathered today will be transcribed, reviewed and anonymised and will feature on the Ring of Steel project website. Barbara McCann, UTV Live, Belfast City Centre. I remember it well. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall have spent the day in Waterford. And in a speech, Prince Charles spoke of his joy at being in the city and reflected on the past two years. Paul Riley reports. Having a smashing time in Ireland's oldest city. The Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall touring the famous Waterford factory <laughs> and toasting a platinum jubilee year with some of its world-renowned crystal. The sunshine helping draw out prides for a royal walkabout. This is the royal couple's sixth official visit to the Republic of Ireland. Their last was pre-pandemic 
in 2019. The prince says it's his ambition to visit every county in the country. He can now check Waterford off that list. Who did you meet? Fred Charles, the best. And what did he say to you? Hello and how are you? I was talking to Prince Charles and Camilla. And what did they have to say to you? Oh, they were lovely. They said it's lovely to be in Waterford. Charles said, um, did I take school off? And did you take school <laughs> yeah. off? And was it worth it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And what's it like having a member of the royal family in Waterford City? Um, I think it's good for the city that gender, it's a bit of publicity as well, that they get to come and see everything around the place. To us, I'm Darren, Ava, I'm sure, he bought Lauriga. These opening words in Irish, an expression of the royal couple's joy at being in the city. I must say, I, I, I cannot tell you what huge pleasure it, uh, it gives both my wife and myself uh, to be with you in Ireland once again, a, a country that uh, means more to us than I can possibly say. Reflections, too, on the last two years. Where once stood borders or seas dividing nations, we have been shown in the starkest of terms just how connected we are as a global community. <laughs> Later, a chance to indulge in some personal passions. The prince, a long-time advocate of green issues, seeing for himself examples of sustainability on this family farm. It's a very proud moment for myself and for the family. I think for the whole local area, there's, there's huge excitement here. It, it was kept secret, I think, for a, for a few weeks. There was rumours going around, so it's nice to be able to, to finally tell people that we have such a high-profile visitor. Tomorrow, the couple travelled to Tipperary, retracing the steps of the Queen in 2011 by visiting the Rock of Cashel. Paul Riley, UTV Live, Waterford. Let's check on the weather now. Louise has the forecast. Time for a freshen up, especially with unexpected showers ahead. UTV Weather, sponsored by Phoenix Natural Gas. Hello there, good evening. Well, it was another lovely settled day. There was slightly more cloud around than recently, but all in all, it wasn't bad. We have a few pockets of mist and fog developing overnight, but tomorrow looks like a brighter day with plenty of sunshine. Looking at the pressure sequence, high pressure remains in charge. There's a few weather fronts out in the Atlantic that will try and move in from the northwest, bringing some cloudier conditions, but that high pressure system will stay with us right through into the weekend, keeping things settled. Staying mainly dry tonight with the chance of one or two spots of light rain. As today's cloud starts to break up, a few mist and fog patches will form, becoming quite dense at times, so do take care if you're out and about in the early hours. Temperatures will hold up at around four or five degrees Celsius. Any mist and fog should clear through by rush hour tomorrow morning. There's less cloud in the forecast tomorrow with a welcome return to sunshine. However, there is a slight chance of possibly one or two showers, but on the whole, it will stay mostly dry with highs of 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. Across the rest of Ireland, it's a very similar day. Once any mist and fog clears, it will be a dry and bright day with sunny spells. Temperatures reaching highs of 17 or possibly even 18 degrees Celsius locally with light winds, so a very pleasant day ahead. Looking ahead, the next few days, there's very little change on the forecast. Plenty of sunshine over the weekend with temperatures staying above average for this time of year. It will become slightly cooler overnight with the chance of some foggy conditions on Saturday into Sunday. That is the very latest. Have a lovely evening and take care. On cloud nine. Now the job is done. UTV Weather, sponsored by Phoenix Natural Gas. Well, that's great that it's going to be nice over the weekend. Well, that's just about it this Thursday, the 24th of March. Paul will be back with our late bulletin at half past ten. The ITV News continues now with Mary Nightingale. From Rose, from me and the rest of us on the UTV Live Tea Time team, have a very good evening. Good evening. <laughs>